I've been running with my kids back and forth to basketball. Oh, yeah. And how are you? She is the dog record. You're the one that hurt your foot, right? Yeah. Is it better? Texas. I have a blood clot. That was your question. No, I didn't know that was his. Yes, it's true. You broke the red board. It's close. So you're taking the blood clot. I was until yesterday. I was in the hospital last week. Oh, now I'm on something else. Okay. I want to see the lawyer very good. Good. Yes. 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 Yes.
under application for safety and security grant. Um, it says that I noted on the current maintenance costs on the authority security system. I'm guessing that I actually requested the actual cost. Yeah, I think that that's correct. Mm -hmm. I see that change. Mm -hmm. Under the agency plan HUD disapproval, is that what HUD actually calls this a disapproval letter? I believe so. It was, okay. I'll have to go, I don't think that letter is in this particular packet, so I'll have to go back and look at it uh, with the caption of this. <coughs> you want to just reflect what the caption of the letter is? What, whatever is appropriate, yes. And the final thing was, uh, here's the final thing, is after we came out of executive session, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that resolution, resolution was to come out of executive session. Okay, so we should say that. That's not a resolution on seven o'clock. No, but it actually says that. It's, it's, it's right above it. it. Right. Oh, okay. But that's, I guess, the format. Okay. So I misread it. I apologize. I think that's a typical format, isn't it? With yeah, the resolution behind it, Any other comments or corrections? All in favor of accepting the minutes? Okay. Any opposed? Item 2 are executive Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone, and we're welcome again to members of the public as well. Before I go into the formal agenda, uh, we have Ms. Donna Cialoni, who is the Family Self-Sufficiency Coordinator for the Housing Authority. We recently wrapped up the FSS program after many years, so I thought it was appropriate for Ms. Cialoni to come and give a report on the activities of the program and we can answer any questions that board members may have. In your package, you do have the summary report of uh, the activities of the program. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Chiloni for perhaps, the next, let's say, a 10 minute presentation. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Martin Ward, uh, Kenneth, staff, friends. Um, I just wanted to do a quick statistical overview since the programs have ended. Uh, the programs, they were all annual grant funded programs, which meant we had to apply every year. Uh, it was not renewal. We had to apply and then uh, see if you got it. You apply about a year before you get it. <clears throat> so we knew this year, you know, almost a year before. We ended that. We were not going to continue. Um, the, the, the report is for the active 13 years that I was here from 2001 to 2014. Time flies. Yeah, time flies. And at that point, we had the New Rochelle Section 8 FSS program, which was the first one for 13 years. We had the public housing program, which was for seven years, and the city, we ran the contract for the city for six years. <coughs> During that time, we met our goal with the city of 32 uh, families that had to complete the program. We surpassed that goal. These, these goals, by the way, were set by HUD, depending on the number of the residents. We had the Section A goal of 36, which was far surpassed. But we did not reach our goal of 50 participants that completed with public housing. We had about 45. And um, that was despite continual recruitment um, with that program. I think if we had been able to go another four or five years and have the time that we had with um, this Section 8, we would have completed that. Um, although both the city, Section 8, public housing families had each 55% in rental increases due to income, Section 8 participants in both the city and the housing authority made more money um, because their rents increased more. And I wanted to give you the breakdown on that. With the Section 8 households, during the 13 years, the rental increase 
and I'm talking about only due to earned income. So we're not talking about any rental increase due to pension, social security, or anything else that would be uh, just an automatic. So due, due only to increased earned income, Section 8 increased 69%, which is considerable. And um, that was a total of $353,000 in extra rent money that came in. Um, out of that, that was 110 households, 76 of them had escrows, meaning that 76 had increased their income. So that's where you got the 69%, was the 76 over the 110. Out of that group of 76, you had 52 that completed their goals. And then 252, almost $53,000 was um, dispersed to those clients. And 70,000 was returned to the rent rolls. It's returned to the rent rolls when they don't reach their goals. So that was you know, very successful. In the public housing, we had 55% rental increase. So it was uh, just about $91,000 more in increase in rent income. Um, out of 47 households involved, we had 26 that had escrows. Um, and 14 of those were graduates, and 70, almost 71,000 of the dollars was, was given to them in escrow money, and only 20,000 then was returned to escrow, to the rent rolls. In the city, which was equal to the public housing, the city had 55%, so city and public housing did about exactly the same. The difference there was they brought in $195,000 in, in increase in rent. So it shows you the difference in jobs that people who live in the bigger community with people around them um, where they have access to uh, a larger community uh, and, and since jobs have a lot to do with who you know, as we all know, who you know who can get you a job, um, you can see the difference in, in the amount of money that those people made when they went out to work. And 60% um, of those households, out of the 60 households that were there, 33 had escrows, 22 were grads, $181,000 was given out in escrow, and only 13 was kept out. Um, so basically, the last piece, the total increased rental income produced by the program, by the FSS program over the 13 years, was uh, uh, almost $639,000. So that was a, a lot of money, $639,000. The extra rent came in because people had earned income money. And the national FSS data indicates that the families that are in FSS continue to increase their rent after the program ends. So do these numbers reflect what must have happened during 2008, 2009, let's say, when oh, sure. you had deficits? Okay, this is yeah. Okay, these are now. Yeah, so, so even in a bad economy, right, because we, we had hardly any jobs, and it reflects also the fact that so many of our clients are in entry level. So even with going to school, the entry level jobs were not there, but they were paying just minimum wage. Um, so, and that had a, a definite effect on it. And that's a bit, I'll take any questions. Has the FSS program been phased out? No, not nationally. Uh, not nationally. No. Why didn't we apply for it again? We phased it out primarily because the grant changed, the criteria for the grant changed to the point where for the last few years it was salary only, and all of the other ancillary support was an expense to the housing authority. So all of the training cost, uh, support cost for Ms. Chiloni's office were all the additional expenses that were no longer paid for by the grant. And so that was the primary reason we had to phase it out. I would love to see that publicized the process. Um, if you were to dream a little bit, uh, how would you make this program self-sustainable? Self well, since it's only salary, to be able to make it self-sustaining, you'd probably have to raise at least, well, you would know better than I would how much it costs to us here, but I would say probably hundred thousand yeah, a year. Fifty thousand to be safe. Yeah. And, and, so and um, 
you know, that, that would take a considerable effort because that's all fundraising. Well, all it's fundraising. increases in rent to the housing authority, though. Excuse me? Increases in rent to the housing authority uh, would certainly go to offset that, so. But to, to raise that money, it would have to be done with fundraising, corporate, and the corporations be, maybe again in a good economy. But the last 10 years, the, so we've hardly been getting back to school so, book bags. Never mind so you don't money. feel that we could raise rents by a, a large enough percentage by a program like this to make it worthwhile um, just based on the increase in rent to pay for it? Not, not I don't think so. Now, years. Now, yeah, I think that uh, I don't think the raising, I don't think the rent connects with um, raising money for the program. Um, I don't see the, I mean, I just don't see the connection between raising the rent and using that money for the program. Most well, people, every dollar of additional rent the right. housing authority right. could collect. Could get it in that way. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, and most, that's what I'm wondering is. Yeah. Could we raise enough money through increased income, and how would you do it to make it so that we could afford to run the program? Well, uh, I would concentrate, and I had said this to Mr. Martin, that I would first of all concentrate on the Section 8 programs, because that's where the more money came in, and more, since you put out actually even more effort when, when you have a program that's not successful than a program that's just rolling along. Again, throwing money after good money is a good idea. So I would concentrate on the Section 8 clients and the Section 8 programs because that brought in more money. And concentrate, which we, we tried to also, and we did target. <coughs> we were allowed to target. We used to go through the roles and actually try to look at who was already working who already had an education to try to get them a better job because the catapulting that way also was made a tremendous difference than bringing in someone who had no education or job at all. Um, and the other group we concentrated on was the welfare to work. Because going from welfare to a job is a tremendous increase. But outside of the public housing family self-sufficiency program, both Section 8 programs, the one we administer for the city of Nourishell and the one we administer ourselves, we reduced our share of the half payment that went out the door to a landlord because the residents' income rose. Right. So their yeah. share of the rent rose. That wasn't a net income to right. us. That, that, was was right. a, that was a reduction in the amount. Of, so it, was, it enabled us to have more people participate in the Section 8 program because we had more resources we could spread around by virtue of the fact that Residents but there's no net gain to the housing authority not, financially not, for not, that. Not um, and of those participating from the housing authority side um, in public housing, were they centered around any particular developments? No, it was open to everybody. No, but in terms of your participants. No, it was, it was spread out. Um, now I wouldn't say it was. I mean, I, I would be guessing you wouldn't have had almost anybody from the senior. Oh, we had a lot of seniors, and we could not discriminate okay. at all. And it absolutely, it, it didn't increase our rent rolls, but it certainly increased their quality of life. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, and it did increase our rent roll, but a very minor amount. But in terms of the quality of the life, mm -hmm. learning to use the computer, knowing, you know, they have another 20, 25 years, maybe they're going to live. So getting into the whole computer age, and being able to shop online, and pay the bills online, uh, and a lot of them not only went to school for their GED and computers, but we had at least three that went on to get college education, and one that went on to get a master's. Now, of course, mm -hmm. she hasn't been able to get a job because of her age, but still, it made a tremendous, you know, it was tremendous added value to her and to the other residents who saw her doing that. So, um, you know, I was happy, I was very happy that we were centered in the building we were in because it was easy for them to come downstairs. And again, we did have more seniors from our building than we had from any of the other buildings, but you know, that's because they could come right downstairs. Was there any single function that you guys had that you would say was the most successful part of increasing income? Uh, again, in public housing. 
in public have any single function. Well, well you know, the theme, I'm sorry, the, yeah. the theme, the overall thrust was twofold. One was job readiness and the other was financial literacy. Right. So mm -hmm. those two were the underlying themes in almost all the activities. So almost all the activities were functioned, were focused right. on, on the job. I'm just wondering if, we, if, again, there might be a way to take even a piece of what the program had in our experience and take advantage of it and turn it into something self-supporting to benefit residents as well as the housing authority financially. Is there any part of that? that I don't know. We would have to get some thought to that. You know, originally, uh, the can, I, can, can I rephrase the question? Based based on your metrics, it seems that you had difficulty in, with your success with public housing. Yes, we did. Right. So, what were the barriers that you encountered to having success with that particular population? Okay. And again, this is just from what they revealed to me, and no more. Um, the biggest problem, I think, was getting the public housing families to allow their success to be seen by other families because of jealousy, because of retaliation. They, they really wanted it private, much more, and maybe it was the close conditions and living so I think, close I think to each other. Here, the, in the Section 8 programs, right. the individual participants were individuals. They didn't. They lived in, in their own neighborhood, their own home, right. and part of a community where other people could really. So, where Section A would bring in friends, family, tell everybody they knew, and that supported them in in the program. The public housing wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do that with each other. And um, you know, so and and it was good that we were in another building because they knew what they whatever came into the office stayed there. There was never any. Transfer of information, they knew that. Um, you know, in 13 years, we never had one complaint that anything that somebody had said had gotten to somebody else. So they knew about the privacy part, but trying to make it something that they wanted to share with their fellow residents to bring them in continued to be a problem. So you're saying exposure to success is a problem for them? Not, no, it wasn't privately a problem. It was a problem in sharing it with the rest, with the neighbors. They were very, so very the exposure successful. of their success. Right, right. Exposure of their success, yes. Yes, that was And that was a barrier? No, that was a definite barrier that we never overcame. Well, hard to gather momentum if nobody knows that something's moving. Sure can't market it. That's for sure. That's interesting. Well, we'd like to thank. On behalf of the Housing Authority, thank, thank Ms. Cialoni uh, for the 13 years that she was the director of the program. She did an excellent job. She always put the interests of the client, resident, or her association to see public success. So, on behalf of the Housing Authority, thank you. Thank you. Number one, I miss the residents. And <laughs> I'm glad that there are so many here because uh, they know I miss them. And of course, it was a pleasure working for the board. You always allowed me to be flexible, to, to use my judgment, and to move in creative ways, which is what we had to do. And um, you know, we got an award for that right in the beginning, and it, it really became the pinnacle of our program, that we could come in early, stay late, come in on Saturdays, come in on Sundays. In other words, meet with the clients when it was convenient for them and not because the door of the housing authority was open and closed. And because of the good security over at 50 Sickles, many, many, many nights we would work to 10, 11 o'clock at night and on weekends, and we never had a problem. 111. The 111. Mm -hmm. No, no, 50, yeah, 111. Mm -hmm. 111 where I was, and the good lighting and everything over there. So I thank you for the pleasure because it really, um, I'm going to miss you know, my career. I'm going to miss my people. And um, the other great thing is that over the years, Mr. Horton always allowed me to use my own personal cell phone, which everybody always has, so that hasn't changed. And I have to say, in my career, I've never had one person, not, not a staff person, not a peer, professional peer, not a client, not a tenant, not a friend, ever abuse that, and they all have my mm -hmm. number. So in that regard, it's nice, because when they were all crying and saying, well, where are we going to find you? I said, you still have the number. <laughs> thank Donna, you. Donna, thank you. Thank you so much. Hope to see you again if we can figure out a way to
Bye. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, move on to the formal uh, part of the agenda, taking uh, first uh, announcing what uh, I believe all board members do know that this Wednesday, the 13th of August at 11 o'clock a.m. will be the groundbreaking for Heritage Homes Phase 2. Uh, we closed on Phase 2 in March of this year. Construction started almost immediately. Uh, two of the buildings have been demolished, uh, 80 Winthrop and 60 Horton Avenue. And uh, we had uh, originally scheduled a groundbreaking, but we, 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 we postponed it. Uh, so we'll be going on this, uh, this Wednesday. And we hope that as soon as, as possible, we'll be able to attend. Uh, the forecast was originally uh, cool but dry, and unfortunately now it looks like it's going to be a little damp. Uh, so, but uh, we'll, we'll keep a bright, bright spirits going on nonetheless. So, the uh, next item is. So I do want to let the board know that we are still finalizing the hello, hello. fiscal year 2015 hello. annual budget, and as soon as that is completed, I will distribute that to the board and also post it on the website, and uh, we'll be asking the board to approve that at the September board meeting. I do want to let the board know that we had the follow-up to the technical assistance that is being provided by HUD, we had a third party contractor, Environnetica, that has been uh, contracted by HUD to provide technical assistance to housing authorities throughout the country, including ours. Uh, they spent a, uh, about a week here um, with the staff getting to know our operations, policies, and procedures, and they'll be making some recommendations to us in the near future. And I'll distribute those to the board when we do have them. So the last item that I wanted to uh, go through formally was review of various HUD correspondence in between the end of the July, in the of July board meeting, and now we've received a number of uh, correspondence from HUD, and I just want to review those and discuss those in a little detail. Uh, the, I believe that you have them in your packet in the order, which I'm going to address them. The first is a letter dated 28th July, and it refers to on-site technical assistance that HUD provided on both May 8th and May 15th, and they listed the nine areas that they reviewed and that they had some uh, oversight with. And as of this writing, they had indicated that these items and issues are still open and unresolved, but they are in fact uh, resolved and to HUD satisfaction. And uh, as you can see from the page two of the letter, uh, they've asked us to reach out to their office to schedule another visit, which I have done. I don't have the date as yet, but I've asked them to give us a couple of dates in September when they can come back so that we can memorialize the record that all of the information that they've requested has been provided. I'll go through these and then I'll take any questions that anybody has on the complete set. Uh, the uh, second correspondence dated 25 July has to do with the fact that we made a request to have a unit taken offline. As you know, the Housing Authority only receives subsidy for occupied units. So the unit is vacant, not only are we not collecting the rent, but we're also not collecting subsidy unless you can characterize or classify that unit as undergoing modernization. So we made the formal request to HUD uh, that it be placed under modernization because we know that we've inspected the unit and we know that the damage to the unit is beyond the normal rental turnover that we would go through the normal leasing process. But unfortunately denies that because we are currently not under contract for that unit. Uh, so um, I've since written back to HUD to let them know. As you know, uh, we board approved entering to a contract with Heritage Architecture. They're in the process of doing the the design and the bid documents, which will include the renovation of this unit. And HUD has said once that work is complete 
and that work has been bid, then we can resubmit the request and HUD will characterize. We'll move the classification of the unit from vacant into under modernization. So we'll continue to get subsidy. Is that the retroactive? No, unfortunately, I don't believe it is retroactive. I don't think so. Uh, let's see. Uh, you should have, I, I believe we're moving on to correspondence of 24 July with regard to uh, currently HUD, when we submit a requisition for our operating subsidy, HUD wants us to submit the invoices to support that subsidy request. This is a change because in the past, Congress would appropriate monies to HUD, HUD would appropriate those monies to the housing authorities, and you would receive an annualized one twelfth amount over the course of a calendar or fiscal year, and you just use it at your discretion. HUD has asked us to provide the documentation, so we had a, an excess of about $47,000 above what our requisition amount was, and they asked us how we were going to cover that, and I believe you see in the response, my response, uh, dated 4 August, that we would resubmit those invoices for the next month's approval. We also did in that letter um, advise HUD that we've been asked to submit this information in two different formats, um, and we asked for some clarification on that, and also on bookkeeping fees. And one requisition they approved the bookkeeping fees, and in the subsequent requisition they said that those were not eligible expenses, so we've asked um, them to clarify that. So as soon as I receive a response from HUD on those two things, I'll include that correspondence in the following in the next month's board package. Uh, we should have correspondence dated 10 July, which is I re we submitted a request to HUD to have partly exempted from we, we submitted a request to HUD to have partly exempted from our REAC scores. REAC stands for Real Estate Assessment Center, and it is the area of HUD where they do independent physical inspections of your properties, and they score those properties. Last year, all of our properties passed the inspection with the exception of partly, and partly brought the aggregate score of the housing authority down. So we ask that since HUD had uh, granted us permission to dispose and demolish Hartley, that we, we could carve it out so that it would not adversely impact all of our scores. Um, HUD, as you can see, indicated that they could not do that, that um, they were, their protocols would not allow us to do that. Uh, they took the position that as long as there are residents at Hartley, because they do have to inspect the units, which we certainly we agree to that, uh, but we did not feel that we felt that since they had already given us permission to demolish the Hartley houses, since they had they themselves acknowledged that Hartley houses was obsolete and not salvageable, that they would concur with our determination to exclude them from the scoring and the ranking, unfortunately not. So we're disappointed in that because uh, we worked very hard to have the other properties pass, which is no easy feat given the diminished amount of operating subsidy and the diminished amount of capital fund monies only to have uh, partly put into the aggregate pool and bring all the, the, the scores from the agency down to the disappointed in that. Uh, so that's the correspondence. If you have to take any questions on any of those particular uh, issues. discussion items and I will um, open by asking, I, I want to follow up on an item from our July meeting, uh, and look at the minutes, in which we discussed uh, the steps we need to take to change our meeting time, and to better accommodate the public, and uh, the reality of some of the uh, schedules of the working people who then take their time to volunteer to come here. I did draft uh, a language which uh, I believe has been circulated, and um, the language is slightly different than that which appears in your minutes from last 
a meeting in the sense that uh, my notes were slightly different. Um, the way I drafted it would be that instead of having your meeting at 5.30 p.m. each subsequent time, rather the meeting would be held, it would be 10 meetings per year, each, should, each meeting would be held at the dates and times and places as the chair would prescribe. And then as far as the time, then by custom you can decide to have it at 5.30 and then and in your notices it would indicate 5.30. If you wish to have it at 6 o'clock for a particular whatever, then you, your notices would then so provide. It seemed to me that it created more flexibility for you on a going forward basis. And, and that would be no fewer than 10 meetings a year. That's right. It's not like describing 10 meetings. Absolutely. Year. Thank you very much. No fewer than 10. That's right. Uh, and of course, with the public, meeting times will continue, meeting places and times will continue to be posted on our website. Hopefully, you will be able to avail yourself of that. Um, and as Ira pointed out, the idea is really to uh, start promptly at 5 30, which is something we've been aiming for under the current format, but this will. Okay, so um, because this is an amendment of our bylaws, we can take action this evening to vote on well, that. Well, we have all commissioners are present. Okay. And the uh, advance notice, yes. So the each commissioner would have to waive their <laughs> right to uh, notice. To so notice for seven days in advance, although I believe that I'm not sure how many days in advance, but. I have a poll that's right in our bylaws, but yes. Seven days in advance. I don't know physically how many days in advance it was, the notice was given, but we're all, all commissioners are present, so. Is there a formal way we have to have them waive that? Waive the right to notice? Oh, uh, well, you could simply have uh, the vote on the, uh, on the proposal. And I think that would be sufficient, unless there's a commissioner who wishes to object. Yeah, but it's, it's I'm going to move that. One other thing, I'm sorry. We also need a start date mm -hmm. for when that would happen. I left that one. Ira has proposed here that Article 7, Section 2 of the Bible should be amended uh, by being deleted in its entirety, and that we're going to replace it with the following statement, which is regular the heading of regular meetings, no fewer than 10 regular meetings per year shall be held. Each such meeting shall be on notice on such dates and such times and places as may be from as may from time to time be prescribed by the chair. Um, Resolve further, this amendment shall be effective as of close of meeting tonight. So moved. I'll second. Second by Shannon Small. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Very good. So that motion carries, and the change to the bylaws will take place mm -hmm. as of close of business tonight. I'll speak with you, yeah, because Angela do not should speak about. Physically changing the bylaws to reflect this change. And this will take effect for the last time. Any other discussion items? I do have a couple <coughs> here. Um, in particular, I just want to share with the board some information on this opening up of the Section 8 waiting list. I'll give you a uh, distributed, if you could distribute that around, please. Okay. So we opened our waiting list up last Monday. Uh, actually, last Wednesday, I think it was the sixth day. And as of today, you can see we have some 3,000 people applied. About 2,000 of those were from the first half hour of the first day that we opened the list. And the rest have been since then. Um, so we can see the breakout you know, with the, the applications were done electronically, uh, so people do have to go online 
as of today, we've only had one person who uh, called the receptionist the switchboard and we will saying that they did not have access to the internet and they were directed to the Nourish Our Library. Um, but we have not received any other correspondence or communications that people are having difficulty accessing. So last, uh, three years ago when we last opened the waiting list, we kept the waiting list open for two weeks and we received a total of 800 applications over a two week period of time. So the fact that it is being done electronically does seem to be encouraging people to apply. To be, uh, it's a relatively simple uh, process. Uh, at the website, there's a link directly to Happy, our sole care provider that's managing this list for us. Uh, I think so. So it's uh, certainly increased the number of uh, people who are applying. We did not have any plans to close the waiting list, uh, but to leave it open. We, will, we may be reevaluating that just based on the sheer number of applicants. It doesn't really make sense for a person to be number 5,000 <laughs> on the waiting list. So, we want to keep it. so while we did want to keep it open, it may not make sense to do it. I think the biggest change from uh, three years ago is the total number of Hispanics that have applied. Uh, we had about 18% of the waiting list was of Hispanic origin. Uh, three years ago, this year is up to about 25%, which is coming a little close to what the county Hispanic demographic is as a whole. Uh, so that would, I think, be the only uh, noticeable uh, change in, in these statistics there. What did you say? What was it before? 18%. 18%. Based on history, how long would it take us to go down a 3,000 person waiting list? It, well, it took us about three years to go through 800 names. Uh, by the time we closed the list, we were leasing to uh, very low priority individuals. We release into residents of public housing, uh, which is, uh, and we release into non Rochelle residents by the time we uh, purge the list and open this back up. So if, the, if that's any guide, it's going to take us about four years to go through this list. Any other questions? So that's, that's working well. I do want to pull a number of news articles to your attention, in particular, the United Water Customers protest rate hikes. Um, we have a uh, water utility, United Water. Our water bills are extremely high. Uh, the water bills, at, um, and even our partners at Heritage Homes have said that the water expense is the highest utility expense that they have. It's higher than electricity and higher than gas. And it is the single largest expense that they have. Um, so, and that's been our experience as well, uh, that it is a very high cost. So you can see that the citizens of Durashell were not happy at all with the idea of the water company petitioning to raise uh, water rates. But certainly uh, controlling water and managing water, I think it is going to be one of the, uh, one of the will be a new priority for the housing authority mm -hmm. and for all, for all development going going forward and residents who go going forward. So I no longer have to walk through the house behind my son's turning off the flat screen television. I now have to turn the faucet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve? Yes. Uh, most of the water comes from the New York City public water system, doesn't it? Do you know? I don't know the origin. I don't know. I, I don't know. I would imagine it comes from the New York City reservoir system, but I don't know the origin. And that's what I remember. Is there been any talk, because I haven't heard of it, of establishing a public water utility? And I, I don't know. The other municipalities, Yonkers, Mount Vernon, have their own municipal water, and those definitely do come from the reservoir system. Um, I'm not sure which reservoir system in Mount Vernon and Yonkers, why Rochelle has gone the route of a private utility for that service. I don't really know the history of it. I think they're French. Well, they're well, French or Swiss government. Mm -hmm. And it's publicly traded also. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's a great it's a growing growing in case we might be able to join with some other groups. Um, it's a long time ago, but it's one of the ways that we got cheap power by forcing the state to allow the hydroelectric rates to come to Westchester by setting up a public power authority. Yeah, I don't know at the, at the state level what the what our state representatives are considering 
but you can see there's definite pushback from the citizenry on how to work. I just want to call to your attention that um, I am honored to be uh, recognized by Westcott and the fall, so we will bring that certainly we'll bring that to your attention. Uh, the uh, <coughs> Father Public Housing Authority Directors Association Legislative Conference is coming up in September, uh, so if anyone wants to attend that, please do let me know. We will be uh, going to Washington to lobby for two things. One, to lobby for a successful outcome to our public safety and security grant, which was submitted last month to HUD, and also for uh, lifting the cap of the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, otherwise known as RAD. So we'll be in Washington for that. We want to let you know that uh, the private banking sector has provided $350 million to New York City, primarily through the Community Preservation Corporation, otherwise known as CPC, to address Mayor de Blasio's affordable housing plan that unfortunately is just in the boroughs, so we will not have access to that. Um, I do want to call to your attention a very interesting article about pushback about a, a building that's been programmed for both market rate residents as well as affordable residents in New York City, the building has become controversial because it has two separate entrances. So the building was designed with, with, what, is called, with, with what is called a corridor. Um, so, so, so you know, I think it's, it's, it's noteworthy in, for example, in New Rochelle, uh, the city established an affordable housing trust fund that required developers who were building market rate and luxury housing to either build a percentage of units within the frame of that structure mm -hmm. or gave uh, the developers the option of funding a trust fund that they did not build the units. And all of the developers in Urshel opted to fund the trust fund. None of the appellees, Trump, et cetera, opted to build those units within the building itself. I think what Trump no affordable housing. No. no units at all. No, no units at all. No. They all they all opted to fund the trust fund. So, so when, they, when they opt to fund, they do it an amount. Or there's a formula. Yeah, I don't know what it is. A, there's a there's legislation pursuant to legislation that the city council passed. I don't know what that formula is. I think it was roughly 20 percent of the units, and so they all opted to fund the trust fund. So it is uh, as we think about redeveloping other public housing, transferring RAG, where there might be a mix of units within the frame of the building. This is something that um, some people are, are opting as a way to address that issue. Uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the news accounts are self-explanatory, and I'll leave you to read those um, at your leisure. And that completes my discussion. Another question, yes. an older item. Status negotiations with heritage architecture? We uh, had a kickoff meeting last week with Heritage Architecture. Our modernization consultants, PHM, were present and um, established a safe harbor threshold, a safe harbor fee of 10% of the construction budget. And uh, that, they're going to be putting that into a contract document. We should have that any day. Uh, they had prepared the contract on the AIA contract form, but HUD has a very specific form of contract. So uh, they got that from PHM and they're completing it and uh, hopefully we'll be going forward. So they're not that experienced with HUD regs? They actually are in that they've done a number of public housing authorities, particularly Newark um, in particular, but um, they were of the impression that HUD would accept the AIA form of contract. So the AIA form of contract is what the contractor will be using. So when we bid the work, that is the formal contract that the contract will be using, but for architectural services, HUD has their own formal contract. Okay. Uh, do we even have one item for executive session? We do have one item for executive session. So uh, for members of the public, we will be going into 
the executive session shortly. Um, we'll, be, we'll be asked to excuse yourself. Uh, we, um, well, you never know. I expected that it would probably be all about 15 minutes. You're welcome. We will let you know when the executive session is over. You're welcome to rejoin us at that time. And uh, but we'll, I do believe that the only action that the board will be taking once we exit executive session will be to adjourn the meeting. But you're welcome to wait um, and until we reconvene in the public session. And I'll let you know. Before you leave, can I just get a motion to go into executive session? Yeah, I'll make a motion to. The session to consider uh, uh, discuss proposed or pending for our delegation. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? This time. Mm -hmm. uh, first, just want to discuss our second Monday okay. of uh, next month falls during the FOD conference and some of us may be attending. Mm -hmm. uh, can we push it? I'll leave to Monday, September 15th. Let's do it. Yeah. Can we do that? So far, is during the, so the, any holidays coming up? Was, was proposed the 15th? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that will be... That one's iffy for me, but is what it is. Well, we try not to um, conflict directly with the conference that we take away from mm -hmm. the show, so if you could adjust. I'll be able to come up. Unless it's iffy, I won't know until conference. So the 15th is it today? Yes. 15th. September 15th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay, we have a motion for Rick Smith to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye.